the news still hit me like a pile of bricks. This is really, really heartbreaking. If this decision holds, we will celebrate it. We begin at 5 o'clock with the reaction pouring into that stunning leak from the Supreme Court. A draft opinion obtained by Politico last night and confirmed by the court today would throw out the landmark Roe v. Wade abortion rights ruling that has stood for decades. Thank you for joining us. I'm Laurel Porter. And I'm David Mulko. And while the justices have not issued a final decision, overturning Roe v. Wade would have massive even seismic consequences nationwide. And that has some Americans celebrating with others deeply fearing for the future. We'll break down what this could mean for Oregon and Washington moving forward. Let's start with Blair Best with reaction from those on different sides of the issue, Blair. While some are terrified at the prospect of losing abortion rights, others are excited, saying they've been waiting for this decision for decades. Now, overall, Oregon has been preparing for a potential ruling like this for a while, and both sides are ready to fight back. Now, on Monday, a draft opinion from the Supreme Court was leaked, suggesting the majority of the court is in favor of overturning Roe v. Wade. That's the 1973 case legalizing abortion nationwide. Now, this draft opinion does not represent a final decision. But Portland abortion right advocates are bracing for what could happen if Roe v. Wade is overturned, while anti-abortion Oregonians are ready to celebrate. When we think about uh, clamping down on access, I think we are basically um, seeing folks who are in elected office use that power to impose judgment. And uh, for folks who are pregnant, we don't know the circumstances. For pro-life Oregonians and Americans across the country, this is what we've been hoping for um, since 1973. Now, again, this leaked document does not represent the court's final decision, and the fact that it was leaked is extremely rare. Now, we don't know exactly when the Supreme Court will announce their final decision, but we can expect that it will be no later than the end of June. Thank you, Blair. So what does all this mean for us here in Oregon and Washington? Christine Pitawanich dug into that today. The Supreme Court's leaked opinion has a lot of people worried about abortion rights across the country. Kim Clark has been busy answering questions. She is a senior reproductive rights attorney at Legal Voice. It's a legal advocacy organization based out of Seattle that serves Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Alaska, and Montana. Abortion will still be legal in Washington and Oregon because both states have, stat both states have state statutes that have strong protections for access to abortion in, in Washington and Oregon. Both states have laws requiring insurance carriers cover abortion. Both states also have equal rights amendments, which um, you know, should pro provide protection for uh, the right to abortion. But for people in Idaho, things would be different. Idaho has both a trigger ban that will go into effect if Roe is overturned, which would ban abortion in Idaho. But it also passed a Texas SB8 lookalike um, statute that enables family members to bring causes of private causes of action against abortion providers. That, Clark says, could force people who have the means to travel to Oregon or Washington to get care. Abortion providers in both states are, are expecting a dramatic increase in patients coming from out of state in order to access care. And that could put stress on providers in more ways than one. States banning abortion if Roe v. Wade is overturned could sue providers in the Northwest. We're not under any illusion that the states that are banning abortion will stop at banning abortion just within their borders. Who knows what changes will come? Former Oregon Representative Jeff Barkley was one of the chief co-sponsors of the 2017 bill that would later become an Oregon law protecting abortion access. After seeing the Supreme Court's draft opinion, he's concerned about what other rights may be on the chopping block in the future, rights like gay marriage. You know, we're seeing attacks on on uh, gays and trans people. You know, this is kind of the, they're breaking the dam open with this one. And uh, I worry about the future. And right now, the future is not yet determined when it comes to Roe v. Wade or abortion access. It is also really important to note that abortion access right now is still legal, like it has been for decades. The Supreme Court's final decision is expected potentially sometime this summer. Christine Pitawanich, KGW News.
And the leak of that draft opinion, Christine, comes about two weeks ahead of the primary election in Oregon. And so today, abortion rights were the leading topic in our debate with Republican candidates for governor. KGW co-hosted a debate with the City Club of Portland with oncologist Dr. Bud Pierce, business executive Jessica Gomez, conservative writer Bridget Barton, and Mayor of Sandy Stan Pulliam. And Laurel and I asked each of them if the Supreme Court were to overturn Roe v. Wade, where they would stand on abortion access in Oregon. You know, we need to support women's health. It's really an important part. Oregon is pro-choice. I'm pro-choice and we should remain that way. My effort will be on to better support uh, pregnant women in their pregnancy after the children are born. I would uh, pull back taxpayer funding for abortions. That would be a goal. And I would try to get back to where most Oregonians that as polled are now, which is only up to the second trimester. I will sign any piece of pro-life legislation that comes across my desk. And there you have it for perspectives. Former House Republican leader Christine Drazen was also set to participate in this debate, but she dropped out a couple hours before it started and she didn't give a reason. You can watch the full 90 minutes now on KGW.com or on our YouTube channel. We'll also have an in-depth look tonight at 6 on the story. And of course, stay with KGW for continuing coverage of what could very well be the make or break issue in a midterm election year, plus the latest on a Supreme Court decision when it comes down. Updates on air and anytime on KGW.com. Today, Portland's police chief is addressing the bureau's staffing issues. Chief Chuck Lavelle says staffing may be at its lowest in July when dozens of sworn members are eligible to retire. But he is also hopeful to fill some of those vacancies soon. Mike Benner talked with the chief today and joins us with more. Mike? Well, Chief Chuck Lavelle believes the city of Portland's size should have 1,100 sworn members. Well, here's the problem. Right now, the Portland Police Bureau has approximately 770 sworn members. Needless to say, PPB is understaffed, and that was highlighted this past weekend when in the span of 13 hours, officers responded to five shootings and several serious traffic crashes. There were so many resources tied up on those investigations that there weren't enough officers to respond to less serious calls for service. We're talking about things like property crimes, missing people. Those sorts of calls were kicked down the road. Fortunately, there may be some light at the end of the tunnel for this understaffed bureau. The chief says the personnel division has hired eight new background investigators, and those background investigators have already had more than 100 new applicants assigned to them, with dozens of more applicants waiting in the wings. While promising, these job applicants, if ultimately hired, still need to go to the academy for training, and this takes time. So Chief Lavelle and his staff are getting creative. Uh, some of the conversations we're having um, is are there, are there ways to outreach to uh, community members to give them a role uh, connected to public safety where they can serve as eyes and ears um, in the community and kind of be um, just a presence, I think, in a lot of places. So the chief there is referring to civilians who in years past patrolled Northeast Portland's Holiday Park and it resulted in a decrease in crime. Could that sort of model in the city's current trouble spots serve as a stopgap until the bureau gets its staffing numbers up? Only time will tell, David. Well, that's an intriguing potential solution there, Mike. Appreciate that. Let's bring an update now on last week's deadly crash in Beaverton involving five Southridge High School students and a Washington County Sheriff's deputy. Now, De Deputy Michael Trotter remains in critical condition. He was seriously injured last Wednesday, police say, when a car with the five students ran a red light and crashed into his vehicle at TV Highway in Murray. The driver of that car is in the hospital. Two other students who were hurt are also still recovering. 17-year-old Matthew Amaya and 16-year-old Juan Pacheco Aguilera were both killed in that crash. The murder trial of romance novelist Nancy Crampton Brophy returned to court today with the defense starting its case. Crampton Brophy is accused of shooting and killing her husband, Dan, who was an instructor at the Oregon Culinary Institute. Our Bryant Clerkley has been covering this trial. Bryant, who did jurors hear from today? Hey, Laurel, the defense started with a landscaper who knew Nancy and her husband, Daniel. The landscaper told jurors that he never heard the couple argue before while he was working on their home back in 2018. Did you ever notice anything that you considered serious discord or bickering or never, anything like that? Never. 
The defense started with the landscaper who did work at the Brophy's house. He spoke about Nancy's behavior around the time of her husband's murder. Another witness, Nicole Barlow, who's a volunteer for the trauma intervention program, told jurors she met with Nancy the day of her husband's murder. I didn't see her. I heard her. Tell, tell us when you first became aware of her presence there and what happened. Uh, when she came on scene, um, I heard her crying and screaming loudly. Another witness, Tamara Alva, who's a friend of the Brophies, testified that Nancy was falling apart after her husband's death. She was in shock. What did she say? You know, she didn't say much, much after that. It was kind of like a in shock. And I said, Nancy, listen, I'm going to let you go. You just get go out, get in your car and get down there. The defense claims the Brophies were deeply in love and Nancy would never kill her husband. The state paints a picture of Crampton Brophy as a woman who lied to police about her whereabouts the day of the murder and stood to gain a significant amount of life insurance money after her husband's death. The trial is expected to last the next couple of weeks. Nancy is expected to testify in her defense, and that defense will continue at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. Thank you, Brian.